Hello, everyone. Good morning or afternoon. I am Chrissy, U.S. Marketing Manager here at Kids and Company and a new face to the Kidco Talks, as I'll be taking over from Miss Fanny in 2024. I want to start with a quick shout out to Fanny, who did an absolutely remarkable job leading our 2023 Kidco Talks. So thank you, Fanny. And I'm very excited to be here kicking off our very first webinar of 2024. So let's get started. I want to thank and welcome Lisa Butler for joining us today. Lisa is the director at Back Bay Speech and Occupational Therapy. Back Bay is a home-based private practice that provides holistic and family-centered services to the greater Boston area. They offer speech, language, feeding, and occupational therapy evaluations and treatments for all ages. As a parent myself, um, speech and language development is definitely one thing I wish I knew more about as my children went through important milestones. So I know if they needed resources or intervention. So I'm super thrilled to have Lisa join us today. So thank you, Lisa. Webinar participants, if you have any questions throughout the session, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we will ensure that your questions will be addressed at the end of today's session to our, during our live Q&A. So with further ado, Lisa, over to you. All right, perfect. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I'm really happy. Um, I love sharing with my community. Um, often I do that through local parent groups and um, preschools, but it's fun to be able to share it with more than uh, just people local to us. Um, so yeah, um, my name is Lisa. Uh, I am the owner of Back Bay Speech and Occupational Therapy. Um, I'm also a speech language pathologist. Um, I am licensed in Massachusetts. Um, so I'm only able to practice um, in, sorry, I'm just trying to organize my screens here. I'm only able to practice in Massachusetts just to get that out there. Um, a little bit about me personally, I have the cutest, snuggliest little dog in the entire world. She's not that little. Um, and I really love my job. Um, it really fills my bucket. Um, it's something that um, it sounds cliche. I really love going to work. Um, I get to play games all day, which is also very fun. Um, speech therapy should be fun and exciting. You should, your speech therapist should feel like your kid's friend um, that they get to play with. Um, all my kiddos definitely think that I'm a friend and I live in my office, um, but it should be something positive. There should be a, a very special rapport built with the kiddos that you're working with. Um, so we'll go a little bit through a very big picture. What is speech therapy? What do we work on? Um, super brief about that. Um, and then we'll really dive into um, speech and language development. Um, what is early intervention? Um, what do, what are language rich environments and how can we facilitate um, language at home with family members, with caregivers that are not yourself um, and just how to make things fun. Um, so speech therapy um, is lots of things. We go to graduate school, we're educated on providing services for all of these different areas, adults and adolescents, often what happens is we wind up specializing because it's very hard in this field to be, in my opinion, to be a generalist and be good at every single area. Um, so often a lot of us will pick a few that we really resonate with and we will um, treat that population. Um, so we can work with speech sounds um, that can include apraxia and dysarthria. So that's how we say sounds and words and put um, sounds together in words. So for example, if a cat, if a kiddo can't say the G sound, they might say pit instead of pig. Um, after a certain age, that's no longer developmentally appropriate and they might need speech therapy for that. Um, apraxia is a motor speech disorder, as is dysarthria. Dysarthria is usually for patients after strokes. Um, and apraxia can hit all, all age ranges. Um, we also work uh, with language. So expressive receptive language, our ability to communicate in phrases and sentences. Can we understand directions? Um, can we understand what we're reading as we get older? Um, 
aphasia would fall under that language um, category, which is what happens after an adult has a stroke. Um, literacy, can our kiddos read? Can, are we supporting them reading? Social communication skills is something we also can work on, which is how well we follow unwritten rules of society. Can we engage with peers? Um, social communication language. Um, this is also can be called pragmatics. Um, we can work with voice. So if someone has like a very scratchy, hoarse voice all of the time, that's something that you would see a speech therapist for. Fluency um, is working on stuttering or cluttering. So stuttering is when you make sound repetitions or word repetitions and it impacts your ability to communicate effectively. Um, cognitive communication, um, essentially working on executive functioning skills. Uh, so how our minds work in a sense, um, skills like problem solving, um, memory, attention, organization, um, and just our overall cognitive skills. And then we also work on feeding and swallowing. So sometimes with this population, the younger population, which is why most of you are here, um, we'll work on transitioning oops, kids from a bottle to solids because they're having difficulty. Or maybe there's a, a true swallowing disorder where they're aspirating, meaning they're getting fluid into their lungs when they're eating or drinking. Um, that's a little bit more on the serious side. Um, but feeding is a developmental process. So we do learn how to eat, chew, and swallow as an adult um, from early, from an early age. So these are all the different areas you could see a speech therapist for, um, but I am going to dive into speech and language development. Um, again, so I want to just preface this with every kid develops in a range. So there are range of numbers. There are going to be some specific numbers we look at, and these aren't hard numbers. As long as we're seeing development, that and change and growth in our kiddos, that's what's most important. If they're significantly off some of these numbers, that's when you want to seek support for your child. Um, but it's also good to know these numbers in the back of your mind, because often pediatricians, they spend so little time with your kiddo, um, and also they're not speech and language specialists, so they don't always know what exactly we're looking for in terms of language skills. Um, so then you can make note as a parent, as a caregiver, to um, reach out to the appropriate services if they're needed, because um, early, de early detection is the best way to to support any kid with a speech or language development. Um, and again, just every kid develops at their own um, at their own pace. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how we view speech versus language as speech language pathologists. So speech is the way we produce sounds. So how we're using our articulators, our tongue, our lips, our teeth, our jaw, our vocal, our vocal cords to say certain sounds. So for example, S, or K, that is speech. Language, we look at as a separate skill, and we're looking at the system of words and grammar that we use to communicate thoughts and ideas and feelings. How, can, how are the kiddos formulating sentences? How are they using their words? Um, so that's two different ways um, or two different areas that we would look at and treat in a child. So speech is the easier one to explain, I think. Um, so we'll start there. Um, this is just to give you an idea. This is a study that was done 2020 um, that gave us some really great normative data. This, these are sounds by age and what sounds each kid should have. Um, so after three, if your kid is not saying the K or G sound, that's when you should go get support because the longer you wait, these are motor patterns for speech sounds. The longer the pattern is ingrained, and then it's harder to change. If you think about, you really don't think how to walk, but if you had to change how you're walking, if you waited a year, it won't be as hard as if you waited 20 years. I'm not saying you would wait 20 years, um, but 
I, I have seen kiddos that come in at six years old that can still not say their K and G sounds. And that makes it really difficult to change because they're so their brain has taken over and they are no longer thinking about making the sound. They just make that T and that K sound as a substitution. Um, so as you can see, most sounds should be developed by about four years old. Um, so this means that a kid is pretty intelligible or understood by um, strangers. That's usually, our, um, I should say, unfamiliar adults. Uh, that's usually our benchmark of intelligibility because parents often, even if there's significant sound errors, still understand their child because they're with them all the time. Um, so for the later developing sounds, which are TH, so for words like the, that thing, um, the ZH is like J, which we don't really use that often. Um, it's in very minimal words, and R. But R substitution is typically a W. So when we're saying, kiddos are saying wed or wabbit for red or rabbit, we understand because we can, our sound systems are developed enough that we can substitute um, the sound error pattern that the kiddo has to understand what they're saying. So around four years old, which I'll show you in here, this, these are some benchmarks that we want to keep in mind as parents, caregivers, whatnot. At about a year old, very minimal understanding by uh, unfamiliar adults, 25%, two, about 50%, three, 75%, and four, we're looking at 90 to 100% intelligibility. Um, if your child is not here, um, it can be because, most likely because they haven't developed the sounds that they need, given their age. Um, peers cannot fill in the gaps like we can, uh, because their sound systems are still developing. So if they're hard for an adult stranger to understand, it's going to be hard for their peers to understand. And that's where sometimes some communication breakdown occurs, frustration occurs and whatnot. Um, I will ask, uh, feel free to type in any questions now that you have about speech intelligibility. I'm happy to answer those um, at the end during the Q&A. Um, and now we'll talk about language. Um, and what we are looking at within language is receptive language versus expressive language. So in order to speak any language, you need to be able to understand it. If you're trying to learn another language, you must have that second language understanding in order to expressively use it. Same thing for learning a first language. If you don't understand a cow is a cow, you can't say that you want the cow while you're playing. So we'll often in an evaluation, we'll look at both skills. And all during play, um, often what you'll see in kiddos who are slightly delayed is they might have perfect receptive language. You say, go get your shoes. You don't point to anything. You don't make a gesture and they come back with their shoes. Or you say, we're going for a walk and they come back with their jacket and their shoes. Fantastic. That's a huge prognostic indicator that expressive language is coming, but they might need some support with it. So if they're say two years old and receptively, they're understanding, oh, excuse me, all of this language, but receptive expressively, they're not using any language yet or minimal language. Um, it, we know they have a good foundation and a good base. So that's why we're often di uh, assessing both. Um, here are some, uh, some numbers, round numbers to give you um, on development by age. And the reason why I separated milestone versus average um, is because often early intervention programs uh, around this, uh, at least in our state, and I know New York too, they usually do, um, their qualifications are based on milestones. And the milestone is what 90% of kids are doing at a certain age. So the lower end of average, whereas the average range is what about, is what the 50 percentile 
50th percentile of children are doing at a certain age. So as a private practitioner, I like to get my kiddos to that 50th percentile because the low average is on the lower side of average. And yes, it maybe they would be okay, but the wait and see approach is never recommended. So if you could give your kiddo a little bit of a boost when expectations are very, very low for language, that's just gonna set them up for, for success in the future. Um, so at 12 months, you wanna, you want the kiddo to have a word and that could be anything. Um, it could be ma for mama, it could just be a sound. Um, my nephew, I use this all the time, uh, this said EO for his lovey, and it was consistent. So that counts as a word. It could be woof for a dog. So it just has to be something consistent um, and something verbal. Um, average is about five or more words. At 18 months, we're looking at a milestone of 10 words. Um, and again, it could be maybe it's just 10 animal sounds and that's totally fine as long as they're labeling and requesting and identifying using those those noises consistently that's fantastic um 50 plus words is the average at 24 months you're looking at 50 words um for the milestone and two to three hundred words for the average and you're also looking at combining two to sometimes three word phrases at 24 months um at 36 months you're looking at 250 words at the low average um and over a thousand words so at that point you're not really you know really counting there um for um this uh cdc uh recently did an update i want to say it was a little bit over a year ago on developmental norms and they are, look very different than this. And I just wanna make note of this. They did not consult any of the research or normative data, and they did not consult our National Association of Speech Therapists or any speech therapist when they made these changes. So if these numbers look much higher than what you're seeing either at the pediatrician's office or anything from the CDC, it's that is the reason why. So I would take that information with a grain of salt. All of this information is from normative data and research. Um, so for nine to 12 months, I, I wanted to show you um, a little something off of um, Instagram, just a little clip of a video um, on what, a, between this age range, I think this guy's maybe a few months, he might be eight months, um, what that should look like. Um, when you're engaging with um, a kiddo. So I'm going to turn my sound on. What does a horse say? <laughs> what letter is that? Color is that? What does a horse say? So you can see the, the questioning. Um, well, let me get back to the right spot here. You can see the questioning from the parent. What's this? What's that? What's this? What's that? Questions don't often support language in the way we think it does. Um, that no, that sound imitation, that is amazing. We're teaching turn-taking. We're teaching imitation skills. The kids are engaged because they think it's really fun that you're imitating what sounds they're making. And you see he keeps going with it. And yes, it's not language, but it's the foundation of language. Um, so engaging with your child in that way when they're very young is a great way to facilitate language development. Um, so some receptive language skills that we're looking for around this age, um, a lot of receptive um, can understand some simple commands like sit down, get your shoes, um can point to pictures in a book when they're named um they respond to their name they can do some basic like gross motor commands like wave and clap um and they're probably gonna use some gestures expressively they'll point um at this age they're communicating really well non-verbally um it's almost like they're they're speak they're speaking without speaking essentially. You can read their body language, um, and they are um, they're 
starting to initiate that uh, verbal communication, other prerequisite skills for the verbal communication. Um, okay, and then 18, did I skip? Yep, nope. 18 to 24 months, um, they are starting to understand some basic spatial concepts like prepositions for in and out, on and off. They can understand some basic yes and no questions like, is this a cow? Um, they understand some verbs. Um, they're following more commands, but without gestures, just verbal commands. Um, they can listen to a pretty simple story. Um, and expressively, they're starting to use a lot more words. You're going to see an explosion between 18 and 24 months. Um, week to week, you should be no noticing an increase. If you're seeing this, that's fantastic. If you're noticing a plateau of language development, that's a great time to get an, an assessment and see what's going on. Um, you want them to start combining two words together, like, hi, mama, bye, daddy, open this, um, anything novel. So two new words coming together. Um, starts to ask questions, not necessarily that they're saying, what's that? But maybe they're pointing to something and saying that, or they're going with their body. That's their way of ex uh, expanding their receptive vocabulary. So that they can then gain that knowledge to use it in the future. Um, having Teaching a kid how to ask questions um, is super fun. Um, a way you can do that is I have a little barn here that's something that makes noises essentially. So like, what's that? And I often find that this gesture becomes the question and then we find out what's inside. You can do it with books that have um, flaps. Um, we can say, what's that? And then we can open it up and see what's behind the flap. Um, you're definitely getting more wants and needs um, and can answer some more basic questions verbally, like who is that mama? Um, you know, where's, they might not verbally respond, but you know, where's your blankie? If they see it on the floor, they can point to it. So they're starting to understand um, more and more um, WH type of questions. Um, and at 36 months, eight month age, um, language has real language expectations have really um grown um so we're starting to understand adjectives some basic concepts um pronouns are starting to come in but not solid um can follow two to three step directions such as go get your shoes your backpack and come back to me that would be a three-step direction um and expressively they're starting to create longer sentences they're definitely answering wh questions and wh questions are what why when and where um why questions are later developing but in general wh questions are those uh questions that begin with wh um and can hold up a pretty basic back and forth conversation that's what we're looking for around this age um, and at 48 months, they can definitely understand three plus uh, step commands. Um, they can tell you a, like a three step story, they're sequencing. Um, so language skills are even higher at this age. Um, so this is what's typical. Now I'd like to just support you in what can you do if your child is delayed? There are lots of options. Um, early intervention in Massachusetts, it's birth to three. Every state's slightly different um, in terms of their age and criteria. It's free. You get a full developmental assessment, um, PT, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, sometimes social work comes, speech therapy comes, and they look at your whole child. They make sure that everything is, um, and they, they give them a standardized assessment. Um, and if they qualify, then they get services free through the state. Um, there is an option to go through private practice. Um, and hospitals usually have outpatient clinics as well that can pro provide speech therapy services. And typically, private practices and outpatient clinics will accept your private insurance. Um, in terms of early intervention, one thing I would like to mention is that 
I'm going to throw these milestones up here again. Early intervention, because it's funded through the state, they have specific cutoffs. And if you are not, if you are hitting these milestones, you're low average, but could still use some support. They might not qualify you for early intervention, but that does not mean that your child is not delayed. So if this happens more frequently than I would like, a family has a two-year-old, two and a half-year-old, they're concerned, they get them evaluated through early intervention. Early intervention, which I wanna say is a fantastic program, but because it's state funded, funds are limited. Um, they won't get qualified for services. And then six months, a year later, the family's still like, but it feels like there's something off. And then they come to an outpatient clinic because they've just waited long enough that they really feel like they need to get evaluated again. And they could have benefited from services six months to a year ago. So you guys, your parents, you know your kiddos very well. If you have an inkling, just get them evaluated. If you feel like early intervention said, nope, they're okay, and you still feel like it's not correct, go seek out a private practice. There's nothing wrong with getting two evaluations. If, if they don't need services, fantastic. Then you've just validated in two different places with two different opinions and you're good. But early detection of delayed language is so important. It impacts reading, learning abilities as you get older. Um, all right, I am, let's see here. So private practice is an option. Um, when to make a referral, if your child is having trouble with any functional communication their wants and needs are not being met they can't communicate feelings and thoughts um they're having being trouble they're having trouble being understood um there's frustration and and or it's just affecting other areas development other areas of development um i'm going to skip through some of this stuff just so i can get to show you some fun stuff here um so language rich environments are where we want our kids to be. Um, and that is school, daycare, anywhere where our kids are doing maybe a, a music class where they're doing the same thing over and over again with the same language. We use this technique um, in speech therapy. Um, hand washing is a great one we do it all of the time getting dressed is another verbal routine we could use it's the repetition of hearing the words and the actions over and over again that ingrains this pattern into the kiddos minds and then they start to use those uh language those words during the language-based routine and they become more independent with those words then we start adding more words onto them for so for example we're hand washing so we've got a two-year-old not talking that much we're going to get out the step stool and we're going to say up 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 once they're up on that step stool we're going to say on for the water we're going to say soap 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 while we pump the soap we're going to say scrub 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 those hands then we're going to say wash 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 turn off and then dry 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 so we're using very simple language over and over and over again single words um you sound like a broken record um, but this is how kids, they're sponges, they absorb everything around them. Um, and this is how by modeling, they start to use and learn how to use language. Um, and school, daycare, preschool, circle time, that is all of school is language based routines. They often do very much the same thing every day, slightly different, but all the same language is used in those. Um, all those different settings. Um, and why this is so important is because your sound system, your language system later predicts like reading abilities and reading skills. And once you get to, and your ability to learn how to read because you need a solid foundation of language to pull words from in your brain when you're reading. And then when you're, um, once you hit fourth grade, you're reading to learn. So you've got a short amount of time to learn to read, and then you've got a long amount of time your entire life to read to learn. So language is really the foundation of our learning system. So that's why this is this is so, so important. 
So we talked a little about verbal routines, um, some other ways that you can um, give some language facilitating options um, is giving choices. So it's snack time. Do you want the banana or do you want the apple? And then you just wait. Do you want the banana? Do you want the apple? If they point, great. If they make a verbal, a gesture towards whatever you're asking them to say, fantastic. They've communicated that. And you do that over and over and over. Um, and then eventually we'll get a verbalization. It might be like, buh, for banana, fantastic. Yeah, I'm so excited. Here you get the banana. And as they get older and develop, you'll start to hear the actual word. Um, you can model language. So when you're finding that the kiddos don't have the language that they need for the situation, um, you just give them a model. So maybe they're getting dressed and all the words will be put on, put the socks on, put on, put the pants on. Um, some interesting, the reason why we say this repetition is so important is because it does take a typical child about 10, 10, 10 to 20 exposures to learn something new. And it can take a delayed child 100 to 300 exposures to learn that same thing. So language-based routines, giving choices, modeling language, the more and more you can support your child and give them access to that language, the better for them. Um, this is also why catching language delays early is super imperative because the gap when kids are so young is so tiny. It's so small that we can close that gap. 50 words, we can get a kid to say 50 words easily if they come into therapy. But when we're looking at a thousand plus when they're older and they're behind and they only have about 200 words, that's a much bigger gap to close. Um, another um, uh, data point is that uh, in fourth grade, it takes eight times as long to catch up with speech language services. So early intervention all the way is the way to go. Um, and make this fun. This should be super fun for you and your child. I wanna give you guys some examples of what I look like during therapy. Um, and it, you, don't need ther you don't need to have your child in therapy to play with them in this way. And they don't necessarily need to have a language disorder for them to play in this way. So I'm going to take out my bubbles because who doesn't love bubbles? Um, and we're doing this all through play. So bubbles, super engaging, super motivating. So many words we can use around bubbles. If I have a really young guy, maybe an 18 month old, I might just ask them to do buh, buh, to make a B sound to request for these bubbles. And I like to use this um, technique called the three by three rule. So what you do is you give them three tries, you give them three models, you wait three seconds, and if they don't say anything, that's fine. You blow the bubbles, because we don't wanna make this too frustrating for your kiddos. Um, so this might look like this, buh, buh. And I'm gonna wait three seconds, buh, buh. I'm modeling with the B, I'm gonna wait another three seconds, buh, buh. And then I'm gonna blow the bubbles. For an older kiddo who's starting to talk, I might say bubbles and change my intonation a little bit so it's very obvious. Again, wait three seconds. There's a lot of value in that silence because you need to give your time's kids to process. I want to say, is it around nine months? The imitation delay can be up to six seconds. It's a long time to wait. But when you do wait, you're giving that kid, that new brain, a lot of time to um, repeat and engage. Um, and then, uh, so that's some bubbles. Bubbles are always fun. Um, our barn animals. So maybe we're playing with our barn animals. And then same thing, some choices. We might say, do you want the duck or pig? And you wait. Duck, pig. And you wait three seconds. Duck, pig. And if you get any type of engagement, they're pointing towards something, they're gesturing towards it, they're reaching for it, you give it to them. 
And this is all through play. So we're not just drilling this over and over again. Maybe then the pig eats the hay on here and we make him go yum, 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 yum. And then we say, let's make him go to sleep or let's put him back in his home. Kids love filling and dumping. So we take stuff out, we put stuff back in. And you make a language-based routine out of it. So every time you play with this game, you play with it in the same way so that your kiddo knows what to expect and what language is expected of them. And once there's talking more, then you can up the ante, you can increase demands. So now maybe we're doing, you have a kiddo that can do, do you want the duck or the pig? And they easily say duck or they easily say pig. You might say, okay, do you want the baby pig? Or do you want the mommy pig? Well, they're ducks. Baby duck or mommy duck? So now what we're doing is we're starting to model two word phrases for them. So now that we're not concerned about their single words, we're now pushing them and progressing them a little bit more to combine two word phrases. And this is all through fun play activities. Um, so yeah, I think, I'm, I'm quite a little bit over on time here, but I want to leave uh, open the floor up um, for some uh, questions and answers here. I hope that was helpful for everybody. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much. We've had oh, so many fun. questions, Lisa. And awesome. Really, right. really appreciate um, how you went through everything. You gave examples, like especially at the end. I think as educators here at Kids and Company, as well as just parents in general, we're, like, we're all like, do you want the deck? So just being, <laughs> just showing that sometimes being silly is really what makes it fun and just being involved. So thank you so much. You all right. It. We have had tons of questions. We've had a lot about just like, um, households with like dual languages yeah so um I'm just gonna start with one question uh she says or they say my son is three years old at home we're speaking in Russian and Spanish he speaks very well in both languages and Russian a little bit more started at daycare in September is he he's starting to speak English a little bit I noticed that he doesn't pronounce correctly some of the sounds for instance sh is very challenging he's saying it like it's in Russian, um, which is not correct. In Spanish, there is no SH sound. Right. So I'm not yep. sure whether, yeah. So I'm not sure whether I have to involve the speech therapist or will he autocorrect it, um, giving him more time, or I would just really love a professional opinion. Yeah, sure. So SH, CH, and J, I'm sure he's having trouble with all of those sound, sounds because they're all produced in the same way. Um, is developmentally is not appropriate until four. So you could definitely give him some more time to develop that. I would say after four, if he's still not saying those sounds, then I would maybe reach out to a speech therapist just to get him some support in that. Um, but it's um, you are born with all of, with the ability to say all the sounds in all the English in all of the languages, not just English. I'm sorry, all of the languages, and it's use it or lose it. So if you don't use that, then you lose that ability. Not forever, um, but just a little tidbit of extra information there. But yeah, I think he's totally fine given his age currently. I would keep an eyeball on it and just model if you can at home or have the teachers model for him at school and exaggerate. Like it's, you know, it's our quiet sound. We say shh for shh be, so that we're really emphasizing it. Um, so modeling right now is totally appropriate. Okay, great. I'm um, kind of piggybacking off of that. Um, somebody else said, can you please talk about the average words for babies? Their first language at home is in English. It says my daughter's 17 months old and we don't speak English at home. She started to go to daycare at 15 months. So it's it should be the same across all languages. So at, at 12 months, we're looking at that like single word to five-ish words. So that noise, it should be a reference. So maybe her bottle is buh. And that's consistent. That would count as a word. Language, it doesn't matter. This is not specific to English. Any language, these are the standard norms. And bilingualism, I get this question all the time, does not cause a speech delay. Just because your kiddo is learning two, two different languages or three different languages, they should still develop, be developing on par. Okay, great. Yeah, we have a lot of questions about bilingual households. Um, another one question was one parent 
speaks Spanish, one parent speaks English. Are bilingual books good where we go back and forth between both languages or does that cause confusion? Does the milestones change? Yeah, so miles, the milestones don't change. Um, I think, you know, multilingual uh, households are super important culturally, um, just to your family. If if there if you notice that there's a delay, the recommendation is to have one parent like you're doing speak one language and the other parent speak the other language until those languages are caught up to where they should be to keep things consistent. So if you're reading a book, it's a bilingual book. Fantastic. If it's in Spanish. Great. Just read it in Spanish. Don't mix in English and Spanish because that turns into more of a the child using a mixed language. What they do understand is like, oh, I only speak this language to this parent and this language to this parent. As they get older, that will change, but it helps to keep the languages separate, which they should in the brain, essentially. So you're kind of facilita facilitating that for them. Okay, great. Um, let's see. One question, what age on average does a child start speaking sentences? So between two and three years old, because at two, you want them to start combining two word phrases. And I count a sentence as a subject verb, verb object. I am walking, she is running, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so 100% by three years old, they should be speaking in short sentences. Okay, great. Another question, my son is five and still has problems with R. Should I reach out to a professional for help? He turned five in November, 2023. He attended speech therapy when he was younger as he was a late talker. Okay. So R is very, I'll say controversial. Developmental norms say you can wait until nine. Mm -hmm. Articulation is one of my specialties. Five is a little on the young side. If I'm treating a kiddo already that has other speech sounds, I might start working on R and see if they're stimulable, meaning can they produce the sound with specific cues on what to do with their tongue? Um, I would say sometime in the next six months to a year, if it's still not developed, definitely go to a speech therapist, um, but it's not something you have to run to immediately. Okay, great. Um, another question, does a child using a soother cause any delays with speech? using a, oh, like a pacifier? I'm guessing that's, yeah, I'm guessing yeah. that's what it's probably um, what referring to. So not necessarily. There is, when kiddos use pacifiers 24 seven, there's something stuck in their mouth. They're much less likely to verbalize if there's something in their mouth. If they're using a pacifier to go to bed, no, that's nap time, bedtime, or like some, other times during the day where you need something to help soothe them, that's okay. But 24 seven is not recommended to have it in their mouth because it, it's less likely for them to verbalize. Okay, great. Another question, I'm observing signs of delay in my son who understands expressive language and interprets them well, but verbal is far behind. What are some of the practices you recommend to encourage verbal language? Yeah. So any language based routine, um, something you do on a regular basis with him, whether that's getting in the car and getting in his car seat and getting buckled up using single words to describe what you're doing, describe what you're doing all day long. If you're cooking, stir, 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 and he's there with you. Chop, chop, chop. Um, single words are the way to go. Using complicated language it almost like filters out of their brain. So if you're using like a three and four or five word phrase, oh, Johnny, little Johnny, do you want to go to the park today? Or park time. They're going to understand park time much more than do you want to go to the park today? Mm -hmm. um, waiting, giving models and waiting um, three seconds. So the three by three rule. Um, giving choices and modeling those choices, what they are. Um, describing what they're doing when they're at the park, maybe they're climbing up the side, you say up, up, up for all their steps. And then when they go down, you say down and you do it again over and over like you're a broken record. 
I feel like we do a lot of these already just as, you know, yeah. as parents just like, uh, you know, interacting with our own children and stuff. So that's good to know that probably you're putting a lot of parents today at ease, just knowing, okay, just my interactions with my child, it really is helping that language, which is great. Yeah. You don't have to set aside like a 30 minute block of time in your busy yeah. day to specifically focus on speech and language development. You just do it in your daily life. Great. That's awesome. That's good to know. I'm sure that, I mean, that makes me feel better. So <laughs> I hope it makes people kind of put some at ease too. Um, another question. Um, we got a little bit more time. Yeah. Uh, can you please elaborate if stuttering is common between age three and four and how do we know if it's developmental or not? Yeah. Great question. So as kids are developing language, um, they might stutter and that might look like, maybe you give them a choice of two different color ice pops and it might look like, I want, I want, I want, I want the purple ice pop because mm -hmm. they're thinking about formulating that much longer phrase than they're typically used to saying. Um, and that word repetition is more common in the developmental stuttering well stuttering because it's not a true stutter mm -hmm. um but if your child is doing more of like a mm, me is hungry that prolongation is more of a true stutter or a m -m 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 me that also is more of a true stutter so if you're unclear as to my advice would be is if you're unclear as to what that looks like either one i would just go have them evaluated it's a one-time thing it doesn't mean you have to sign up for services and you're going to a professional that has studied for many years in that area so this can ease your mind great um another question which i was kind of I, i'm glad somebody asked this because i'm like my kids do this too um it says my son is four years old four months has started to wonder if it's within normal for him to say the it sounds more like the and earth sounds more like earth yep. um from discussion it sounds like it might be normal for him but those sounds he's which it's still developing through five and six we still often get yellow for yellow um should he have been moved on to saying him correctly by this age? So four, he's four, four. Is yep. that what you said? Four, four. So yep, four years, for, four months. for L, no, he should like, yellow is always tricky. That's usually, even if they can say like light lion lady, fine. Sometimes yellow will lag behind and be le, uh, yeah, yo. Um, mm -hmm. Or sometimes lelo, where it's both W, both L's. Um, at five years old, that's when L is technically delayed. So if by five he, he can't say L, uh, then that's when I would reach out for services for that. TH, totally appropriate that he's saying like duh or fa, because sometimes it's a voiceless sound. So he might say the F sound instead. That's still very developmentally appropriate. Uh, six is when that is um, considered delayed. Um, and then, and you can give him models. You can just be like, let's try and bite our tongue and just see if they're stimulable at home. Like, let's try and say, so you say, bite your tongue and blow out the candles because mm. you want airflow coming out. See if they can do it. If they can, fantastic. Practice it once in a while. And then you can start putting it into words. Um, and that's finding out if they're stimulable. If they're stimulable, it means that it's coming. Um, for R, same thing. So earth, E-A-R-T-H, it's a combination of the R and the T-H. So of course that's going to sound a little bit funky, mm -hmm. um, but the R is developmentally, developmentally appropriate not to be able to say at four years, four months. Okay, great. Um, kind of my own question. I'm just going to throw myself into this going off of that. My kids say a lot, like my daughter, when she was like two to three, used to say like my iPad, my iPad, instead of like my iPad. And I never corrected her. And, but like, so, so now my son who is four, sometimes he's like, oh, my iPad, my iPad. Is that something that you should correct? So that way they're learning like the correct words, especially as like they're old going, like as they're going older in age, like when do you correct it or do you correct it? Yeah. So 
often what that sounds like to me, and it it should be a pattern of other words too, where the final consonant of the word is essentially being chopped off. And that's called, that's a phonological process called final consonant deletion. At two years old, totally appropriate. I think that's around three years old that that's where that process should be gone. Um, so at an older age, you would say, you might give them the cue of like, yeah, it's an iPad and say the full word for them. You don't want to overemphasize some of these words because what happens is you wind up saying iPad and then you get an extra vowel at the end and then your kids start imitating it and it becomes iPad instead of just iPad. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're only seeing it with like a single word or two, then it's probably just like they're, they didn't know that that was the actual word. But if you're seeing it across the board with lots of things like, ca like cat becomes cat, dog becomes daw, you're seeing a pattern of this, then that's when you would reach out for services for that. And it would not be appropriate. Thank you. Sure. Um, I have to ask this one just because I think it's so cute. It says, what are some tips for a strong start in speech development for a four month old infant? She's gnawing on a rattle, enjoying your presentation. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. So uh, noises, imitating noises, imitating yeah, kind of like the video noises. you showed, like with that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Lots of noise. So when you hear her, so four months, she's probably, or he or she is probably starting to like smile a little bit, imitate their smiles. Um, and it might be a very delayed back and forth reaction at six months. I, the delay is probably more than six seconds, closer to 10 seconds. Um, oh, there's a really good person who's going through this currently. I'll see if I can find it. You, please email me because I have a great Instagram account for you to follow because um, she has a she's a speech therapist and she has a baby that she's going through with this current thing right now. Um, and then any any noises that they're making, any vocalizations, you're going to sound like a fool, but it's going to be so beneficial to your child moving forward. Okay, great. I think we have time for one or two more. Yeah. Um, one person asks, our daughter doesn't put spaces between words. She's two and a two point two five, so almost two and a half. Is there any other point correcting her? Is there any point in correcting her at this stage? Example, mommy, more water, please. It's mama water, please. So kind of like a run on. Okay. So I would go the extreme opposite and go so slow with your language. We tend, I talk so fast. When I'm with my kiddos, I talk so slowly because they need time to process language too. Um, so I would say, oh, mommy, I want water. And maybe some changing in intonation so you're marking that each word is something different. Um, and that might help a little bit with that. Great, great, great. All right, I think we have time for one more. I'm just scrolling. I'm scrolling. Yeah, um, yeah. One thing we kind of talked about, Lisa, is like how long does like therapy usually last? So yeah. somebody who maybe gets, let's say, gets seen, how what can they expect from there? Yeah. So speech therapy is so individualized. It's hard to put a number. And I, I do get this question all the time. How many sessions is this going to take? We really just don't know. Some kids maybe work on a speech sound. Some kids, maybe it takes three sessions to get an SH sound. Some kids, it might take 10. And then we've got to work on it in words and then in phrases and then in sentences. And then in all the different word positions, the beginning of the word, the end of the word, the middle of the word, because it's harder to say in all those different word positions. And then spontaneous mm -hmm. speech. So that could take, it's definitely months. It's not a weeks or a five sessions or a three sessions. For language, it's usually six months to a year, at least, depending on how old they are. Usually late talkers are about a year to get them caught up to where they need to be. Because in the first couple months, you're really often working on getting them to understand imitation. So you're using language, but you're often not targeting language because they don't understand the foundations of language, which is imitation. That's the first skill to expressive language. Okay, great. Um, guys, thank you so much for all these questions. I know we, we don't have time to get through them all, but um, Lisa, 
thank you so much for this thank wonderful talk. I would think it was a great one. It was so exciting. It was my first one. I had so much fun and I think <laughs> you were the perfect speaker to kick us off. Awesome. I super appreciate your knowledge and the services that Back Bay has to offer as a general, sh also just a shout out to all speech and occupational therapists and our audience or community. Thanks for all you guys do. Um, we'd like to remind all participants that there will be a recording sent out of today's session as well as the survey that will be popping up as soon as you end so please take a minute to provide your feedback we appreciate that um and then thank you everyone for joining us today and i look forward to seeing you back uh, um february 13th is our next kidco talk and thank you again lisa so much thank you bye everyone